it's time, and uh, let us start the session. Uh, I, am, um, I am Ryusuke Masoka, uh, research principal of uh, Fujitsu System Integration Laboratories, and I'm chairing this session. Um, first, uh, this talk is TLP White, and uh, please mute your phone, and uh, Q&A will happen at, after the talk, and uh, use standing microphones over there and there. So, uh, speaker today is first Queen Norton. Uh, she's a writer who likes to hang out in the dead end alleys and the rough neighborhoods of the internet where bad things can happen to defenseless little packets. She started studying uh, hackers in 1995 after a wasted use of Usenet and BBSing. Her writing uh, tends toward uh, science and technology, and uh, her projects tend toward uh, towards, um, supporting uh, journalists and activists. She has covered uh, sci tech, copyright law, robotics, and uh, body, uh, body modification, and uh, digital politics and culture, uh, culture and medicine. But no matter how many times she tries to leave, she always comes back to hackers. Okay, so much for Queen. And uh, now, Raphael. Uh, Raphael Vino uh, is a security researcher at the Computer Incident Response Center Luxembourg, Circle. You know it. Uh, since 2012, Raphael wants to increase the IT consciousness of the human beings populating the in, uh, internet in order to make it safer for everyone. That's important. His day job is a mixture of forensic and malware analysis with a lot of Python on top of it to glue all the pieces together. He loves sharing and uh, thinks everyone should contribute to open source project. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, so the title of the talk is Watching uh, Web Pages in Action with Luki Lu. Right? Okay. So, flo floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, this is Raphael from Circle, and I am Quinn from the internet. Um, uh, and, uh, w but we're really here to introduce you to Looky Lou, um, a piece of software we've been developing for some years now. So we all know the web is a terrible place, but how terrible is it really? Uh, so uh, we, uh, we created a tool to figure that out, to look closely at what happens when web pages load. The term Looky Lou is kind of an American vernacular term uh, used for either a person who uh, walks into a store, looks at, touches and picks up everything but doesn't buy anything, or uh, for the people who gawk at traffic accidents while they slowly file by. And uh, Looky Lou, we'll show you both of those aspects um, uh, of Looky Lou doing this for the web. But let's start in a nice place on the web. Uh, don't worry, there's plenty of train wrecks coming later. Um, this is a nice, clean website, which is also full of interesting content, which may interest you. It's the EFF, or Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's the uh, internet's first and original digital rights organization. They have to be really well behaved in terms of compliance, privacy, tracking, and so on, since that's kind of their thing. Um, we're all pretty sure this website isn't doing anything too dodgy. So that's what happened when uh, you open EFF.org uh, in your browser, and it's loading a bunch of content. And this is the looky loo view. Yes, that's the looky loo view of, of, the, well, of the website. Um, so what happens when you open a page is like you load a URL, and that URL is going to load some extra content. Uh, so from the left to the right here, you have content loaded by each of those, of those URLs. Um, so yeah, times move uh, left to right. And there is no cookie set in, that, in this capture. Um, so those ink, ink icons show you the content that we look at specifically when, um, when we open websites. And those ones are like well-behaved nodes of the first page of EFF. And you can see it loads uh, six JavaScripts, uh, three CSS files, and 20 images. 
uh, on those content, like those for the CSS are loading um, a few more images on web fonts. It's just pretty normal stuff here. So what is looky-loo in general? That thing you just saw a little tiny snap of. Uh, well, it's a forensic tool. Uh, it's uh, for mainly for the investigation of websites showing website contents, but also kind of capturing and just giving you an interface to see websites in motion. We're indexing all of the headers, resources, and everything that is sent or received, mapping that onto a tree, the tree you just saw, and displaying what type of data each element is, along with links, there's links inside there, um, to the element's content and hashes for that content. This, is, this will be important later. Uh, the more you use your particular instance of Likilu, the more valuable it will be. So Likilu is not uh, developer tools of your browser. It has some overlap, and you will have some of the resources that you see in Likilu that are also in, um, in developer tools, but it's really first and foremost a forensic tool. Uh, so it can find things in a capture that are hard to find anywhere else. Uh, as well as its context, and we are hashing and correlating all the resources between websites. Um, so we are capturing it away from your browser, meaning that the capture is done in a dedicated browser. It is not the one that you use on a daily basis, so you don't end up like leaking any of your own information or potentially being compromised or anything like that. And it also gives you a way to configure the browser you're going to use to do that capture. Uh, and we are saving everything that we like we capture during that uh, that you get during that capture, so it can be study, studied and analyzed later on. And another really interesting thing is that it gives you a blurry version of the screenshot. You can also unblur it, obviously, but that blurry version of the screenshot of the page can be really useful, useful when you realize that you really wished you didn't see it. So that's really important. Like you basically, you have a way to not, not see every screenshot that you capture on yeah, that, that on Lukido. That was a pretty early feature request, and we suddenly realized it was a very good idea. Um, so why did we build Lukilu? Uh, like most good stories, it starts with a room full of lawyers. <laughs> uh, so back in 2015, we were brought in by some friends to have kind of an educational informational session with a bunch of media and journalism lawyers in New York. And um, we were kind of there to scold them about serving malvertising. Uh, and they were kind of there to find out how to not serve malvertising. <laughs> that was one, it was not the only focus, but it was definitely one of the things that we were all talking about that day. Um, so my field, I'm a journalist normally, uh, my field has a lot of problems these, these, these days. Our traditional business practices have evaporated and everyone's just scrambling to survive, which means that journalism is a big old target for both above board and below board exploitation. Um, and these, these me uh, media and journalism lawyers were really worried about being hacked and being taken advantage of because it was happening a lot um, in this time range especially. I suspect it's still happening. I just don't think it makes the news that much. Also, because we're, um, we're, little, we're a little nattering sewing circle, we just love reporting on each other getting hacked and then reporting back when the other one got hacked. <laughs> so I guess that got, I don't know that the malvertising getting away, but the reporting got less fun over time. Um, so uh, when, when they said, these lawyers and, uh, and essentially the people they were working with kept saying to us, how do we know what's on our site? And we looked at each other in, the, in a room full of people like this, and we looked at each other and we said, and we realized we didn't have a tool to give them. And um, we looked back at the lawyers and said, we'll get back to you. Now, initially our thought was, okay, there'll be something out there and we can send it to people and they can in, in, integrate it into their, um, uh, into their infrastructure and their processes. Uh, there was nothing, there was nothing out there that actually allowed people to see their own websites or other websites in motion. So we built it. Um, and it, let's go back to the EFF example. Uh, again, clean, simple and safe. Um, and we're running this page through a browser a headless browser, we're mapping all the connections to the content on a phylogenic tree. That's the format you're looking at here, which shows time left to right and resources as they are accessed and placed on the page. 
There's always a relationship. We always try to preserve that relationship. There's always a time flow. And that's what a phylogenetic tree specifically gives you. Phylogenetic trees are used to map evolution for life on Earth. Uh, the web is complicated and terrible, uh, but we're betting it's not more complicated than several, several billion years of, of the evolution of life. We hope. Uh, the EFF site, we use it because it's very simple, but it's a real exception. Most things are not like the EFF site. Most large websites are, are agglomerations of cruft and crud and content and code that's never very well maintained um, and never as maintained as the website admins thought it was going to be or at least hoped it was going to be. So at the other end of the spectrum from the EFF is Fox News, which is an absolute mess. And not the way you think I mean, mess. <laughs> oh no, oh no. So that's how it looks like when you open the, e the um, Fox News website in Lucky Loo. So like, it's not even half the tree you have on the, on the image here, like it's just way bigger than that, but we couldn't it, just it fit just it. It would just be like tiny lines, you could see nothing if we yeah. put the whole tree up there. So yeah, like that, and that's the front page, that's just like you load the front page and that's what happened. Uh, you're getting from Europe 12 megs of content, um, just like by waiting for long enough. If you load it from outside of Europe, like US, it's going to be way bigger than that. We guess it's somehow related to the fact that try to do some GDPR compliance. We don't know, but anyway, it's just like, it, it can go really crazy. Um, and it's, it's content, it's also crap, mostly crap. Uh, and that's, just not, that's not editorial, it's a lot of ad networks, tracking, widgets, all kind of probably broken things that admin haven't noticed yet. And like all those complex websites, um, they are like badly managed software project uh, full of craft and cups. It's just a lot of things going on that who knows what's, what's happening. And before you think you're picking on Fox News for the fun of it, this website has the distinction to be the most uh, constantly crashing Lucky Loo. Basically it was just like too big and just making all kind of stuff. So we had to rewrite part of the code in order to make it just support those kind of big websites. So it's just not the content. It's also like everything that is happening on that specific page. Fox News is a great way to test an application like this. <laughs> <laughs> so what is Looky Loop good for? Um, here's a, an overly busy slide on that. Um, beyond, oh damn, that page is a mess, the web is a mess. Um, let's actually kind of drill down and look at some more security focused use cases for Licky Loop. We can get past this busy slide, um, it'll be somewhere online if you want it, um, and get to examples and explanations. So here, here is Trust Wallet, the most trusted and secure cryptocurrency wallet, conveniently named Trust Wallet so that you know it's trustworthy. <laughs> of course, it is not Trust Wallet. <laughs> it is a phishing wallet, it's a phishing site intended for Trust Wallet customers. Um, so this is how the phishing site is loading and you get to see the infrastructure and even the stuff they're kind of using trickery, most of which is redirects at this point, um, to hide. This is also where capturing, hashing, and building the data page of elements really comes into its own. So that's another example of phishing websites here. Um, so LuxTrust is a two-factor logging system for Luxembourg government on banking. And again, that's just like a, a phishing page. And as you can see here, you end up with a few redirects. And when we look at CSS on this page, um, we see that um, the same CSS, so like the same blob uh, that is used on the phishing website, uh, is also visible and is also used on other captures. In that case, we have that CSS. Yeah, yeah I was just gonna say, just to make it a little bit more clear what's happening here is we're kind of drilling down. We're essentially clicking through the nodes on the page. We're not demonstrating that, we're just putting it in slides, but so, so you know how we got to this particular thing. Um, yeah. We're going from the node to the content to, the, to a list of the things that was there. Yeah. And what happened here is that we have like that CSS resource that is uh, loaded on that page. And we can see that we have that same CSS document also loaded in other captures. And that's where it gets really interesting to have a lot of captures in your, in your local instance is that you can find um, like similar phishing pages um, that have been seen by other people in your organization. So that's just like the reason we hash all those resources 
and, and store them locally on the instance, on the Lukilo instance. And it, it has the nice effect of um, when you see something that isn't Lux, that isn't Lux Trust, you know, that has a CSS, you know it's, um, it's not supposed to be there. Uh, because Looky Loo captures everything in time sequence and maps it out, we catch infrastructural bad actors that are using techniques to obscure what they're doing. Like this is a case of a targeted phishing attack which very quickly redirects to um, Google when it, it detects that it's not actually at the target it wants to be at. Uh, so normally when that happens, you lose the middle layers. Like you know something happened and now you're on Google. Um, but uh, but Looky Loo lets you actually expose everything that happened before the redirect to Google. Uh, so Looky Loo accidentally turns out to be great for finding GDPR violations, and oh boy, <laughs> oh, so many, so many. it's there's no good news, none. <laughs> Um, for instance, uh, the Mirror, a newspaper in Britain, I know they're not technically in the EU anymore, but they're still, they haven't scrapped GDPR yet, and it was just the first thing we found. <laughs> this is all over, believe me. We found it, uh, French yeah. news websites were terrible. <laughs> um, and uh, so what we see here uh, on the Mirror's website under Looky Loo, and again, it's one of these huge ones, so we're just exerting a little bit of it, is uh, before actually any consent can even be given, before you've even clicked agree, ad services from Google and DoubleClick are in an iframe. They're setting and reading cookies, uh, and there's more evidence down the line of stats and tracking um, IPs. There's a lot going on in this tree. Uh, journalism companies are some of the worst regular offenders we've found on privacy tracking and GDPR, and that's because our only business model left is selling uh, you, you to social media companies who are slowly dismantling our industry. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so uh, let's go a bit into like how Looky Loo is built and what kind of tools um, are used. So in order to do the capture, uh, we now use Playwright, which is an amazing tool by, uh, developed by Microsoft uh, that is mostly used to um, just test websites, basically to just like make sure that the website is responding properly uh, to, to anything that is just, just like, just like a con continuous integration for websites. Um, we just switched to Playwright from another tool that was called Splash that was not really maintained anymore. But Playwright is basically a full uh, headless browser that you can configure the way you want. Uh, and it is great to just to use in, um, in Looky Loo. Uh, the other tool we are using is called ETE Toolkit, which is a Python library developed by biologists to represent phylogenetic trees. Um, so that's again like a bunch of tools that are linked together and as I said, like just you put glue between all those tools and then you have something that is usable. Um, so yeah, that's what we did for, uh, for like the back end. And for the front end, um, we're using a D3.js, which is a JavaScript library that we used to like actually represent the tree itself on the page. And Flask, which is a, web, a, a Python web server with um, Jinja, which is like the templating um, system. So just like all those tools like jam together with some glue and then you have Looky Loo. Okay, let's took, take a look at some specific features and the interface of Looky Loo. When you start a capture on the first page of Looky Loo, you have some choices to make, uh, including your browser user agent and configuration of your capture. So browser configuration. Obviously, browser agent changes the contents of websites. Uh, so we let you configure that. Uh, but there's one limitation here, which is that we can't change how our website respond or how our web browser is responding to website probing of browser capabilities. So if the site that you're, you're uh, accessing is um, is using probing more than user agent, you're, that's that's kind of going to that's going to show or not show, as, as, as the case may be. Uh, so there are a few modules that will make Playwright harder to detect, um, like Playwright styles and stuff like that. I didn't implement them yet, but there is something that we can do about that to make it harder to detect. Uh, right now, it's still seen as a headless browser, so some, uh, some people trying or some websites trying to like poke what figure out what is browsing them. Will um, will just detect it and block you. But we are looking at implementing it 
in the near future. Uh, configuring um, the initial settings of the browser, we have the standards, HTTP headers, refers, cookies, proxies, uh, obviously geolocation will change what kind of um, mess you get from Fox News, um, but also cookies allow for you to do scans with a logged in state, which is pretty vital for, for a lot of applications. Um, so, yo dog, I heard you like captures. Um, uh, now you can do more captures from your captures. In this case, for instance, like if you've, if you've got a bunch of URLs from there, you can click to kind of do further captures on those URLs. In this case, uh, it, it would be useful for, say, you've got phishing that's been blocked by Bitly, but you want to investigate that. So you have the URL and you can re rerun that. And we keep the state in case you need cookies and refers, et cetera. Uh, so, looky -loo, as we said, it's like a tool you can install in-house. Uh, it's really useful to allow your users to like notify you about something that they want you to investigate. So, this is extra special. Yeah. <laughs> so, in that case, uh, you can just basically click on the on the web interface, enter an email address and some details, and it's going to submit a notification to the admin, admin of the platform. Um, you also have the ability to um, connect third-party tools. So in the public instance, we have VirusTotal and URLScan.io that are um, automatically there, so you can just like, look at, uh, at the results from those two um, services. Um, if you install LookyLoo in, in your own organization on yourself, you need to get your own API keys. Um, but Sorry, LookyLoo doesn't come with VirusTotal. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's just like an extra few features that you can have that are quite handy. Um, yeah. So let's go back on like when you when you investigate specific nodes. Um, when you click on a node, you, can, you it's going to open a pop-up. On that pop-up, has a lot of information about all the requests that have been made um, to load the page. Uh, so when you have, uh, when one of the resources downloaded is an image, you can hover over that the icon and you will see the specific image, uh, pretty handy. You can download each individual resources. So if you want, if you have like a specific entry, like a CSS or some JavaScript or something, that turns out to be potentially malicious, you can just click on it, download it, and investigate it manually. So you don't have to like try to scramble to figure out where this specific resource comes from. You can just download it. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, yeah. In the other integrations, uh, we have obviously a MISP um, integration. So you can search uh, like from a, from a capture on a MISP instance. Um, oh, let's just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and when you have hits, so any URLs or uh, IPs or resources, it's going to, to show you uh, like the event in MISP, you can click on it and open the MISP, uh, the MISP event. Uh, so that's just like a handy way. So again, on the MISP um, integration requires you to have your own MISP instance. Like it's not, you cannot access that. You can't use ours. Yeah, like you cannot access like circle MISP instance in that case. Uh, yeah. And you can um, trigger, so you can like do a search request against MISP, but you can also push a capture on a MISP instance. So you can configure it, I and mean, if you are used to MISP, you see like the um, info field and then the tags and so on. And when you click, it's going to publish to like submit the MISP um, event on, on the MISP instance. Okay, um, we have an APA in case you're afraid of, ma of your mouse and love looking at code. So you can basically do all those actions, like all the actions you, you had on, uh, on the web interface, you can do it over the API. So just like there's a Python module, but it's just like a simple REST API. You can just um, use it as it is. Uh, and you can submit to MISP and everything like that. Um, okay, so we have, this is fairly new, we have a looky Loo browser extension which will allow you to submit the page that you're on, logged in or not, to an instance that you've configured. I hope that you can see the problem here. Uh, because please, please never use this on a public instance or an instance that you don't control or, or can completely expect what's going to happen. Your login cookie will thank you. <laughs> your, your, your credentials will thank you for not putting this into the public. <laughs> um, but it is, it is convenient and powerful if you have your own instance and, and your own kind of more closed ecosystem. So yeah, that's a close up on the, on the browser plugin. So you can see you can like select what you want to send to the capture. 
so again, like if you have, if you're like on Facebook, you're logged in on Facebook, and you submit that to Lucido instance, it's going to also push along all your cookie jar containing your login cookies for Facebook. Do not configure that plugin on uh, to, to connect to a public Lucido instance. Very bad to use in a cyber cafe. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, just. Be careful about that. It is, it, Lucky Lou will let you shoot yourself in the foot. Just know that. I mean, it's harder to shoot yourself in the foot if you don't use the browser plugin, but we gave you the power. <laughs> uh, so what's next for Lucky Lou? Uh, we are um, uh, revamping the, we've had some user testing. We're gonna be revamping the uh, UI. Uh, I got sidetracked on that project for roughly two years. Anyway. Um, um, one of the other features that we're going to add soon is uh, passive SSL, supporting passive SSL. So basically we will get like all the SSL certificates and hashes and so on, and throw them in a passive SSL system that we have at Circle, um, just to again do lookup against that passive SSL instance and submit new, um, new indicators. Uh, the other one that we are going to implement soon is um, uh, like integrating it with Pandora. Pandora is another tool that we develop that is used for analyzing specific files. And the idea will be to select a file from the capture, send it to Pandora, and then you will have uh, just details on like what, what that uh, specific file is doing. Okay, and um, long, more of a stretch goal at this point, but we want to create kind of a modality to it, a modes for different investigative uses, whether we're talking about security, which is most of the focus right now, um, people who are trying to do research on the web, people who are trying to learn how the web works or teach how the web works, um, and of course the legal applications that were uh, somewhat the beginning of uh, the genesis of, uh, of Looky Loo. But that's in the long term. Again, I still have to redo the UI. <laughs> Um, so who is Lucky Lou for? I mean, obviously security people, you guys. <laughs> uh, but also, I hope in the long run, for the lawyers who inspired it. Um, uh, I think it could be a great tool for journalists uh, who are looking at malfeasance and bad things on the internet. Um, website admins, and we have had some, some feedback from people who are using this on their own website to try and figure out what the heck is happening. Um, and then ultimately, educators and students, I think, would be a great application for this, and already has been. Yeah, yeah, I've been using it uh, in a class in, I was giving uh, last semester to just like, teach students how the web works and show them that it's a lot more complicated and messy than, messy than they thought initially. And heck, that we thought initially. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we learned a lot by developing that tool. It's just, yeah. And uh, where do you get it? Yeah, so we have a public instance uh, at Circle, so lucky.circle.lu. Uh, you can just like use it, submit your own, uh, your own URLs. It has and, an API. Yeah, it has an API and everything. Uh, if you use this one, know that the data is hosted at Circle, so please do not submit like login cookies or anything like that. That would just be very annoying to like clean up afterward. Uh, and it's open source, obviously, so it's all accessible on GitHub. You have install guides and just explanations on like what you can do with it and how to configure it on um, on, on GitHub. Uh, yeah. And that's us. Uh, so now we throw it over to you guys for your questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I. I I thought uh, clicking a GDRP uh, link, uh, consent to it, it means something, but now I know it's, <laughs> it's nothing. Okay, uh, so question time. Uh, there are two uh, standing mics, and uh, okay, go ahead. Just a couple of questions. One is on the JavaScript engine, are you running a full JavaScript engine to detect everything, to detect set timeout based redirects or set timeout based uh, pull-in. What about things like service workers and uh, cache, where you can use cache to basically proxy requests behind the scenes, and the session storages, local storages also where you can do uh, corruption of content. Yeah, so it's going to, it's basically running in a full browser. Like it's really using Google Chrome headless, like a complete browser. So it has access to all of that. Um, we are still like working on getting the playwright setting 
in line. Right now, it's, it's going to, it has cookies, it has local storage. Um, we allow a bunch of permissions to the browser. So it, it can do, like, a website can do almost everything, including, like, geolocation and so on. Uh, we need to look more in how we can handle timeouts. Right now, we have, um, like, basically, Playwright has really great support for that. You can, like, wait for a specific amount of time before you, you close the capture. Um, we don't have, at this point, uh, a way to like, make sure that all the timeouts are over, but it's possible with Playwright to implement something to basically make sure that all the timeouts are still, have, been, have been triggered. It's not there yet, but by default, we wait um, five seconds after the last network interaction. Uh, so it will catch a lot of the cases. It will not necessarily catch all of them, but it's still possible to like, bypass uh, looking on, like, figuring out, like, just not necessarily run everything, but for most of the use cases, including like malicious websites, like phishing and so on, it, it worked most of the time. And when, the, when I have a use case that is like not working properly, we always try to like implement it and fix and find a solution for that. So if you have like times where it's like not working as you expect it to work, let, let us, us know. know. <laughs> yeah, like GitHub, open an issue, send us an email, like happy to implement a workaround. Yeah, so specifically though, with the service workers, where you can, a lot of the malware today uses service worker to hide URL mm -hmm. request is not even visible if you use the developer tools. Yeah. Have you looked at that yet or no? So um, it's great, basically what we use uh, from Playwright is HA output, so the, the HTTP archive output. So if it's in there, we will have it. If it's not, we won't. Um, but I should definitely look at, uh, like, I think it's going to be there. I think the HIR has, like, a lot of that content. Uh, but, yeah, like, we need to look at it. Like, we need to see if there is, like, stuff that we are actually missing. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah, please. I have, I have two small questions. One is, uh, is it working only with the website which is live now, or can I use it uh, to submit the whole web page when I, we, I have, for example, uh, I may need to analyze the website which was, uh, which was live on, in the past, but not alive now. So I can get it from, a, let's say, Wayback Machine, or it, it, I have the full package. Can I submit it and get analyzed? This is the first question. The second one is, uh, does it give me the full overview of what the website has, or does it also help me to understand some malicious uh, part particles it has? For example, if there is a stored XSS, for example, on the website, can I get this result from it, or am I, am I, am I expected to get the uh, files and analyze by myself? Um, so you will you expect to analyze it by yourself? Like you don't have like. We, that's the kind of stuff we can add. Uh, like we can probably figure out like if there is a way to detect that there is a stored XSS. Um, I mean, obviously, if something's already in, say, you know, virus total, and you have that, it will flag it. We, we've also flagged um, safe scripts. Yeah. Um, which is kind of the reverse of that, but still somewhat helpful. Yeah. Uh, so we've got things that are marked safe uh, mm -hmm. from. Uh, yeah, for like a, a CDN GS. Yeah, so yeah. All the libraries that are known on CDN GS as legitimate will be flagged on the site, like on the capture, as legitimate. I mean, again, like legitimate is not the right word, but basically as at least a known JavaScript from a library that is existing and has been published. Uh, so that's like one of them. Uh, and, uh, yeah. On, on the first question, I yeah. think it was the, uh, it's just basically we need the HAR file. Uh, yeah, yeah, so for, yeah, for like the first question, like when you have like, um, like if you, if you have a, con a page content, you cannot just submit that to Lucky Loo. Like, that would be interesting. The thing is, right now, what it does is really takes a URL, load it in a browser, and generate a HTTP archive blob. Um, it's using yeah. the HAR file to do that. So, I mean, you'd have to pick at it a little bit, but it would be entirely possible to feed it a stream of those, but that's the format that's, that it's expecting. So, yeah, if you have, uh, like, if you have cap, like, if you like capture websites and you get the HA output, so the HTTP archive output somehow, you can load it into Lucky Loo. It's not like easy to do right now, but that's something we could do in the future, just like using that and then generating a tree out of it. Certainly, if that's, if that's a more common use case, we can implement that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, last question. Yes. Uh, 
regarding the artifacts uh, from the capture, and you mentioned they are being saved locally on the machine. It is just a CSV or some other, uh, like a JSON, or is it a structure? So it's stored in HTTP archive blob, so it's like in JSON. And so basically you have like H HR file has like, it's a JSON document that contains all the requests and all the artifacts are stored in base, as base64 encoded in the, in the JSON itself. So it's a really, it can be a really big JSON document that contains everything. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, let us thank the speakers again. Uh, so please provide, the, uh, take your time to uh, do the survey in your mobile app as much as possible. And uh, the next talk will start in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks for not scaring me, all of you people. <laughs>